Perfect. Uh, to this talk, I mean, just introduction about myself, an architect, urban planner, human geographer, and a lecturer. Today's topic um, is an emerging topic that uh, came through my um, investigation, my PhD investigation on the Lebanese Syrian borderscape, uh, investigating the uh, uh, marginal territories on that border and how refugees were coping uh, through modalities of waiting and through their perpetual waiting. And today's topic is more about how Syrian female refugees were able to cope uh, within this condition. So the title of this uh, uh, paper is the Contracting Empowerment Repercussions and Waiting Modalities Through Rhythmic Activities Among Syrian Female Refugees Living in, uh, living in ITSs, Informal Tented Settlements, Along the Lebanese Syrian Borderscape. Uh, Lebanon, located in the Middle East, and the case study is uh, in the Beka area. Uh, there are two camps that were investigated. It's an in-depth uh, ethnographic uh, investigation that focused on two camps that are within 10 kilometers from the borders. And they were formed uh, since the beginning of the crisis in Syria. The uh, interviews uh, covered uh, around 168 semi-structured interviews Amongst of uh, these interviews, uh, 108 were conducted with refugees, and uh, it was ensured to have a balanced type of the gender interviews. So out of those 108 interviews, 58 interviews were done with female refugees, Syrian female refugees in both camps. Just want to give uh, a visual on the conditions of these camps. This is camp one. And we're going to see camp two um, shortly. Uh, you can just see how the living conditions are so dire. Um, the uh, informality is so strong. They are just uh, abutted by host communities, uh, farmlands. These were originally agricultural lands. And uh, during the crisis, when Syrian refugees came uh, and escaped the, the, the harsh war that was taking place in Syria, uh, they rented actually those agricultural lands, transformed them into ITSs. They do pay rent, and they are under the hegemonic power of landlords. Uh, they have a shawish uh, who co coordinates everything within the camp, he's an elected Syrian uh, refugee. And the uh, it's, it's not part of the study, but the Shawish could be a male or a female. But within those two camps, the Shawish was a male refugee. So to access this camp, uh, it needed a lot of layers in, in, in getting approvals from governmental authorities, landlords, and the Shawish uh, himself. Camp two is considered to be one of the most uh, deteriorated informal tented settlement in the Beka area. Uh, it's smaller in size. Uh, they just live by the uh, black water that is spread all over the camp. Um, just, I'm just giving you an overview on the context. It's interesting here to see that, if you can see, you can see like a concrete footprint uh, there was a tent over there that was uh, demolished because it was not uh, abided by the temporality uh, of uh, materiality that is uh, uh, imposed by the government. So only timber, uh, plastic sheets uh, that are allowed only. So if there is anything that has a certain permanent uh, appearance, it will be demolished. This is just to give you an idea uh, how harsh are the conditions over there. And the interviews were conducted uh, between 2019 to 2020. So this uh, investigation ended just before COVID. Uh, also to say that uh, they were also conducted during winter time uh, because this is where the harsh period uh, 
uh, that hits the informal tented settlements, and you can just see that flooding is one of the uh, most uh, um, affecting issues on, on, on Syrian refugees. What's interesting that in Camp 2, uh, the, the, from the emerging findings of the research, uh, women empowerment was strongly present there, and, and I'm going to discuss this short. So you can see those small street alleys in between. This is still in Camp 2, uh, using uh, billboards, reusing billboards that were used for uh, advertising or anything just to be able to cover their tents because what was it what 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 is provided by NGOs and INGOs is not sufficient so they go and reappropriate their space uh, to uh, uh, enhance their protection from those environmental conditions that are very harsh especially in the Bekaa area where the temperature and, and winter is probably the harshest in Lebanon. So this chapter, I uh, just want to minimize this here. Yep, this chapter unravels the gender role reversal. And I emphasize that because in this, uh, in, in, in this investigation and in their waiting, when Syrian female refugees came from Syria to Lebanon, there was a gender role reversal in refugee household responsibilities through rhythmic practices and their habits. So in their, protra in, in their pro protracted waiting, Syrian female refugees living in ITSs had a new role. Uh, the dominated male traditional role pre-crisis here is, is observed to rescind due to an emerging female economic and, and, and new status that we're going to discuss shortly. Uh, the, the ethnographic study revealed that the common denominator amongst female refugees while waiting, that uh, they are becoming decision makers. They're finding uh, new opportunities whether in labor uh, and, 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 or in providing uh, uh, food to their family uh, and turning their passive waiting into an active waiting. So at the beginning of the crisis, their waiting was passive, but shortly was turned into an active waiting and we're going to see how. This chapter decodes, uh, decodes how pre-crisis uh, uh, situations forcibly shrouded skills became unlocked in, in those encampment contexts. So there is a certain gender, gender empowerment through habits, through new opportunities, through rhythmic practices. Uh, next. So it's, it, it's, it's uh, decoded into three sections. The, section, the first section, the section A uh, of this chapter, unwraps uh, what I call the bricolage of rhythmic activities that induces empowerment and replaces the passive waiting with an active one. Section B, it's the, the second part, examines how the inclusion of the female gender in more commanding societal and economic roles reposition local community labor dynamics and gender roles, enhancing social cohesion. And this social cohesion is not only limited between refugee to refugee, but it's, it also extends to the relationship with the host community members because this is where they're finding most of their uh, labor opportunities. A better integration, a certain household independence in those contested ter territories that, that, that uh, uh, are the ITSs. Sex section C, uh, this is like an, an interesting finding that emerged from this investigation. How the sense of home, how the longing for home, we know that you know uh, once you leave home, especially when you're a refugee, uh, the collective memory is embedded uh, within within you, within the uh, spatial manifestation. But the longing for more changed in the Syrian female refugee population more than the male uh, refugee population. So it's being always renegotiated and reconsidered. And I will discuss this also shortly. Uh, I just want to give uh, some statements from uh, refugees that uh, were interviewed. So uh, in the first, we'll, we'll talk about the Section A, the empowerment workshops and activities. Uh, you know, INGOs and NGOs conducted uh, empowerment activities. It's, it's exactly matching today's day, International Women's Day. So one of the female refugees just mentioned this. I participated in the Danish committee every event. Uh, mothers from the camps and community participated and presented something they prepared. It was really a nice experience. But the 
uh, fallout in that, that such daily activities are not often. They are also unevenly distributed geographically, meaning that they do not happen in all IP assets. It's just uh, very selective. They are uh, ep episodically initiated with no follow-ups being implemented. And this is where Syrian female refugees started relying on their own self-independency on, on, on more inner rhythmic activities that relate to their collective memory and to their original home. In other interviews, resiliency emerged as well as solidarity. So uh, this is a heartbreaking uh, interview. Uh, she lost her husband. She, she didn't say where he is. It was mentioned that he was missing. She has six children. She built her own tent. And the, mat the materiality that was received from uh, the UN and other NGOs were not sufficient. So she had to uh, uh, buy extra. Uh, additional uh, fabric and, and tarps. Uh, she and some other refugees uh, compatriots helped each other and they helped her to build the stand. Um, she still live by herself. I remember that interview very well. And she, 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 she is the sole household provider. So such conditions and activities showed resiliency reliance on self, self-empowerment, independency, and by be becoming a single parent household. Uh, INGOs initiated empowerment activities as we saw before, uh, trying to revitalize the collective memory of Syrian female refugees, but no follow-ups or practical channeling of these empowerment mechanisms. And this is where the shortfall is. So female Syrian refugees initiated their own rhythmic habits and activities. And in this photo here, we see how this uh, Syrian female refugee uh, is baking what is uh, uh, called in Syria tanur. It's part of the uh, cultural baking habits. So uh, the, the, the camp too had several tanurs, some of them not functioning. Uh, they were like probably two or three functioning. And, and this is a place uh, where uh, Syrian female refugees gather around the oven. They cook together. They, 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 they chat together. Uh, the, the male presence is rare. So the, the empowerment here is beyond the activities. It's also beyond just baking. It's also by this type of uh, social gathering, socializing together. Uh, enhancing their solidarity, uh, shifting their perpetual waiting into more of a resilience waiting, into more of uh, uh, coping better within these harsh conditions. Uh, what I also saw is, is, uh, is the way they reappropriated their home, when I call the home, the temporary home, which is the tent, and I'm going to show photos shortly. So the recurrent common denominator in the findings is that women are appreciated of these opportunities. So th there was not like uh, a certain, uh, how can I say that, a regret. There was like a hope in, 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 in such activities and rhythmic practices. Uh, a revelation of their uh, pre-crisis forcefully shrouded skills started to emerge here. So their skills that were shrouded in, in Syria they, they, they started to burgeon more in those ideas, and this is the paradox. So um, what's, uh, what's interesting also in this investigation is this finding. So uh, they also asked for work opportunities typically perceived and reserved for male gender. And here we're talking about construction. So uh, one refugee expert uh, was also surprised uh, and they tried to gain consent from the NGO to include women in construction works. And those construction works were related to their IT assets in enhancing the infrastructure. We saw how the infrastructure is very dilapidated in those IT assets, how the, sewer, how the gray water and the black water is running together. So they wanted to be part of the construction and they were actually very active in that. So here we have the gender role reversal, inclusion of the female gender in more commanding societal and economic roles uh, 
within the uh, system, within the community as well. Section C, which is the conclusion of all that. Through waiting, through those rhythmic practices, through the self-empowerment, where shrouded skills uh, started to verge more in those ideas, is the sense of home change. However, they were able to transfer this collective memory. They were able also to keep those practices alive within this camp. So we're seeing here images inside a tent. And, and personally, I was surprised how tidy, organized, it's more of recreating what they lost in Syria, recreating this original home. But by waiting and by recreating this, by having additional new activities, by having this gender role reversal, they are hesitating now to go back. Their sense of power is emerging strongly while they are waiting. So Syrian female refugees found in their habits, ITSS activities, empowerment workshops, and access to type of labor that was not present pre-crisis, a sense of independency and power. And this is being always negotiated and this uncertainty to go or to stay is still alive within Syrian female refugees. Thank you.